thank you very much uh and good afternoon to everyone um yeah and thanks especially to hillary uh this booklet is very it's very clear and it's short uh which is in, in it, i said it's in a good way because i really hope that it will circulate widely uh in hands of not only like of declared anti-fascist, for example, but reading circles, uh, students, uh, groups, or whatever, quite widely, because it captures this theme clearly and, and in, in very concrete terms as well. So it's really, really important uh, publication. Um, and thanks for the left for as well inviting me, and of course, thanks for the translating uh, this important booklet. So my name is Tero Toivonen, and I'm an environmental historian and a political economist, and uh, been researching quite widely uh, issues related to political climate change. And currently, I have this three-year project on far right and, and and climate and ecology. I'm mostly focusing on because I'm a historian. I'm I'm trying to contribute to existing and emerging research by uh, taking a long term basically 100 years uh, uh, look on, on the Finnish far right, but also try to compare its development uh, to, to the uh, far right movements and far right parties in, in Europe more widely. Uh, and um, yeah, so this morning I reread the booklet and uh, uh, didn't have like a concrete plan what to talk about uh, today, but I picked a few things. And I think that the things that I'm going to say are, uh, I can frame them a bit similarly that Hillary already did that. What is actually the relation between far right and environment? And uh, what is actually going on uh, when far right, <laughs> far right is talking about climate or nature or environment or ecology or so on. So I will pick up a few points. And then third, I will say very briefly something about the last question that you have there, uh, what we can actually do about this. And then I hope that instead of us talking, we can engage in dialogue very soon. And I will not definitely clear the table about the Finnish case. And I hope that jo Sonia has uh, time to contribute to that as well. I'm pretty sure about that. Okay. So the, uh, I'm, I'm going to come to this slide. I made this slide uh, for another presentation that I was giving a year ago, or something like that. So it's just let's let's just keep it there, and and let let me emphasize that when we approach far right and environment, we are approaching this wide continuum of really diverse thoughts, really diverse, diverse tactics and strategies and so on. And in different countries, there's a different traditions, of course, related to these things. In core European countries, let's say, uh, Italy, German, France, there's a long tradition for quite sophisticated uh, far-right ecological thinking. I'm not that sure if that's the case in Finland, but of course you're pretty familiar with the uh, far-right ecological tradition in Finland, especially since 1970s, which uh, quite often comes back to Pentilinkola, for example, of course. But a few things that I wanted to say. Um, Hillary's book points very well out that uh, any, basically, well, any social or political movement, it ha it's also an environmental movement in some way. It doesn't mean that it has a sophisticated ecological thinking necessarily, but it means that at least in the idea of what it has about ideal community or ideal society or how social relations should be organized, nature is always there. And let me give you an example. Uh, let's say 1920s, 1930s in Finland. Uh, there was not far-right ecological movement or anything like that, but we were, you who are here uh, know pretty well that we had a, a fascist movement which was really, really powerful. And it was closely connected to what else than forest sector, right? And the, the far-right members or far-right actors who were part of quite high positions in, in, in forest sector, they wanted to do two, two things. Basically, uh, destroy the organized labor, right? And then uh, organize nature, this, uh, in this case, forest nature, as efficiently as possible to gain profits uh, from the forest sector. 
So this is how far right always work. It uses labor power in hierarchical ways to organize nature. And this for me is also like ecologism in far right in Finland, 1920s, 1930s. So that's one example of that. We could talk about a lot of more uh, examples. Um, but uh, then again, while saying this, we need to be really, really clear, and Hilary is really clear about this, that I will say that environment is never, we can debate about this, but it's never at the core uh, of far right ideology. Uh, it uses environment to make its core standpoints more stronger, which are, as Hilary shows, uh, racism. By the way, racist right in Finnish context uh, would be hard word maybe to use in our public discussions. You would get straight away quite strong attacks. But at the same time, it's exactly the word that is right. Because that's <laughs> that's that's what at the core here. So basically, if you look at uh, the core standpoints, uh, racism, xenophobia, uh, nativism, uh, authoritarianism, uh, and then you look at any political sector, let's say in Finnish discussion, uh, I'm pretty sure that you have followed like the recent discussion about education in Finland. But the Finn party, Finns party is of course saying that the problem in education is the immigrant children in the class, in the school. And we need authoritarian discipline measures to, you know, organize schools again. If you talk about economic policies, we need austerity. Act, accept this very core idea of neoliberalism, that we need austerity. And how we're going to handle this uh, problem of public debt is, of course, cutting from uh, immigration uh, policies or support or cultural policies comes all the way down to the immigration as well. And same applies for environment policies. And Hilary's booklet shows that pretty clearly that, and you can pick that uh, up. It's not the main thing that the Finns party, of course, at least for now is saying, but it's still there. You see Allah, for example, can say that, uh, 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 Anti-immigration policies are the best environmental policies. We need a stronger borders, as Hilary already said, to protect our country so that the immigrants cannot come here because when they come here, they will increase the uh, level of carbon dioxide in this country and so on. So they very well can add up these kind of uh, discourses, but they use environment to make these core standpoints stronger. Uh, and then the, the, the third thing that I wanted to say about the, the far right and the, its relation to environment is this continuum. And this, this is how I think we should approach as thinkers, uh, discussants, uh, researchers of the far right. And what is important here is the fact that far right as historical fascism, fascism as well is always a moment of crisis, right? And uh, this this is really well pictured in in, in uh, Chetkin Collective's book uh, White Skin Black Full, where Zoni has been one of the writers. It's it's a crisis movement, and when society is cri in crisis, they can uh, deliver or, or these more radical ideas can travel all the way up from extreme right to radical right. And what is the essence, essence of about far right is, of course, that it aims at radicalizing political center. So we need to keep this, this very simple explanation for this table, but we need to keep this in mind that even though, let's say climate denialism is, for example, maybe a minor thing currently, but it's always inside far-right parties. But it might well be that in a crisis situation, it can enter to the very core uh, places at the public discussion. So it's not gone. Uh, it can very well be stronger in the future. Okay, the second thing that I was uh, planning to say was that what is actually going on here? And this, hopefully we can come back to this uh, in the uh, discussion section. Uh, so Hillary very well pictured that we have these three modes of uh, far-right 
uh, for our attention towards climate change that we have outright climate denial, then we have climate skepticism, and then we have acceptance. And that's really important to note because all these arguments are currently going on in, in our uh, public sphere in Finland too. There's a very good book coming very soon, uh, written by Christopher Ekberg, Martin Hultman, uh, Kirsti Jylhä and Bernd Wörter. Uh, it's called Climate Obstruction. I guess the Finnish term would be ilmasto estäminen or ilmasto hämärtäminen. And it offers a bit similar but, but different. And I think this is very important uh, concept. Uh, climate obstruction is, first of all, climate denial. That's the primary way of obstructing climate discussion. And then there is the secondary obstruction, which is like climate delay. And I will say, if you look at the context now in Finland, the Finns party, for example, it operates in this field or this level. Of course, it has climate denial arguments like Teuvo Hakkaranen saying that God is the one who is making the weathers and there's no such thing as climate change. But that's quite minor thing about the party. And then there's the delay arguments. All these people are in climate hysteria, we need climate realism. If we regulate, if we use environment regulation, our national industries are going to escape to the countries where the environment regulation is worse than in Finland. Climate regulation is threatening the ordinary lifestyle of, of people, taking sausages out of the tables and so on. So these are all some versions of climate delay argument. There's a lot of more of them. And far right definitely is not the only actor who is spreading them, but it's also a political center. In some cases, I will say, and this is a research that I'm doing now, it's also climate experts and climate uh, and energy experts, but we can maybe come back down to that because far right has its own experts that it can pick uh, always in these questions. Okay, and then the third uh, climate obstruction is the a cultural one. The, the very like everyday cultural ways how we people live. How we basically you can have uh, a person saying that climate change is an existent, existential threat. We need to do rapid measures. That was the 93 percent, 90, 93 percent that Hillary showed to us in Europe that they recognized that climate change is an uh, important threat and we need to do, do about it. So we need to uh, act fast. Uh, but then again, you can agree on that statement, but still continue keeping doing your driving with your car and eating your sausages and, and all that. And when these climate delay arguments get more attention in the public sphere, they also support this cultural behavior, which is like cultural denial right, in, in our everyday life. And that's where it may uh, in the future also give more support to far right climate ideas. Uh, we can talk about that as well a bit later. And then this is maybe the last point that I have for this, what is going on. I would like to say that, of course, far-right party, and especially the Finns party, it practices climate populism uh, in a way that it's saying that uh, climate policies are threatening our national sovereign, sovereignty. Uh, it's like I said, it's, it's, it's threatening our national industries. It's taking the societies out of, 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 of the table and from the uh, kids' mouths and so on. So all these are very important to recognize. But if we focus only on this, then we, I think we miss quite big part. And it's especially the part that Hillary is talking about here. And I could talk, say that this is the material side of far right that it always comes down to racism in environmental questions. But even maybe more important, which we haven't really discussed yet, is the fact that far right also has an idea or vision how to organize society. And then these questions that might be really separate nowadays, or I mean currently, like self-sufficiency, outer key, anti-globalization, uh, they can they, they are drawing these together, especially now. You can see this in the Finns party communication after the start of the war in Ukraine. Uh, it gives a moment to collect these ideas. And this is where we need to pay attention as well, not only populism. Um, and then uh, 
I wanted to say something about neoliberalism in the far right, but I'm not going to say because that would be a bit a uh, long story, but uh, just very briefly about it. There's a lot of good uh, research on tracing the common roots of far-right ideology and neoliberalism. And in this moment of crisis, these things seem to come together, uh, and they seem to come together in Finland as well. Uh, and you, you see that in our uh, election debates now. Basically, we can have a coalition between the coalition party and the Finns party. They both support austerity measures. Even the far right is supporting them uh, in a more radical version than the, uh, not, uh, the, the traditionally neoliberal party coalition party nowadays. And the only, only thing that there's actually an obstacle is the fact that will coalition party accept the Finns party's target to move the carbon neutral target of Finland 2035-2050. And I will say that that's not a very big threshold for them because that can be uh, supported by the fact that we are in, in energy crisis and we need to move that target a bit further and so on. Just one example how these things come together. And the third thing I'm going to give the floor to Sonia was uh, how we going to fight this. And I have like at least seven points here, so probably not going to go through them all. But I will say that um, at stake here is to build a very broad anti-fascist coalition and, and uh, with, which, which brings together uh, environmental movement, anti-fascist movement, uh, and, and also trade unions and so on. And it needs to work in different levels, uh, not only as a grassroots mom, uh, movement, but it needs to share the understanding that there are really big questions at stage here. So I'm talking about also having an understanding of economic policies, which far-right or neoliberal parties are practicing and putting forward, but also, under, uh, also creating its own vision also showing that we can actually solve this climate crisis problem. There are solutions for it. They're going to be hard and we can totally have a different economic policies to back these transformations in society. And uh, like Hillary said, not necessarily literally, but the core problem is capitalism here. And like Hillary said, we need a systematic way to analyze that. And we have tradition for that. Let's say it's a political economy or Marxist political economy or whatever, so that we don't drop in that trap of conspiracy theories or whatever. But then again, this is not enough. I will say that in this emergency that we now have, the progressive movements should also see that private capital can be part of solution. I know that I'm not necessarily in the left wing circles. To, this is not a popular idea. But why this is important, and I'm going to end with this, is that understanding capital as a very diverse person in this moment, we can also see huge splits inside capitalist class. For example, in Finland, uh, the Finns party are, in their argumentation, very close to the forest sector, for example. In other countries, it's fossil capital, but here maybe a good example is forest industry. And I'm wondering, this is just for the Finnish audience, I'm wondering that where the forest sector that is lobbying strongly against climate regulation and climate measures, where does it need the traditional supporter Keskustapuolue anymore, the central party? Because their speaker party, now, which might be the biggest party after the election, the Finns party, who is actually more effectively putting forward climate delay arguments that support the ones that the forest sector is putting forward. So here we see a split. There's this black-green tradition of industries, extractive industries in Finland, in other countries. Uh, and of course, the main target is to tackle the fossil capital uh, leave the fossil fuels in the ground, but then in Finland, for example, this causes a split in, in different sectors of capital. And we can have private capital that can work towards the aims of uh, 
uh, active in the climate targets. Just want to say that to the left-wing circles, and it's important also in the sense that we can see splits that far right is there and in there, and we can marginalize that climate delay that is happening in the uh, coalition between far right and some some industries maybe. Uh, yeah, then the other six points, but I'm going to leave them out and then and, and give us time for the discussion. Thank you very much.